Ah yes, to climb or not to climb. Moving up the rank ladder is a very challenging task, but what it really comes down to is game sense. With Overwatch having a list of heroes with various kits bearing their own strengths and weaknesses, in addition to the team-based FPS, the game reserves itself to be more brain, less aim, where the other skills, being communication and mechanics, are complementary to game sense. Comms is great for strategizing just to say, let's push top and I'll bomb point or something like that. Um, and calling out what the enemy has used and where the flanking raw dog is because it seems like no one wears headphones. That's how comms can help win games. The issue is your teammates either didn't hear you or they didn't respond in the right way. Mechanics allows you to carry, definitely, but it can really only rocket you in terms of SR if you have game sense to enable that, to put you in the right positions and act at the best time. You can get away with it until a certain point uh, in the rank system where the enemy team decides to find more impact by comboing alts or counterpicking your hero. So you're not finding the same impact and you have to rely on your team more. That's not the direction I'm heading. More about the guide itself, the idea I want to teach is having the perspective of relying on yourself to make the right decisions that allow you to win. Clarifying that Overwatch is still a team game and you'll need help from them, there's no way around that, but you will you would be surprised by how much impact an individual can have in a game. That's my point. I want to give you guys an outline for how you can carry games by putting yourself in positions to succeed. Now this guide is going to be hypothetical, but what I want you to grasp are the ideas for why you should or shouldn't do certain things and to make you guys think more critically about the game. If you truly want to improve, it's going to take effort by employing some of these concepts and that will give you the experience that helps identify what works and what doesn't. Okay, long intro long, I think I got everything I wanted to get at, so I think it's best that we start the video. The name of the game is to find the most value. Whoever or whichever team finds the most value is going to win. So what is value and how do you find value? Value is a measure of the effective output from things like abilities, and it correlates to the amount of time spent or invested to get said value. If you had gold damage throughout the entire match, but your team is losing, then damage is actually worthless. It's only when that damage is converted to picks does it actually find value. Okay, so what about finding value? Using the tools in your kit to create or press advantages and trading resources positively are the ways to do so. Creating or pressing advantages are simply using resources, i.e. abilities, to tip the scales and power level. Meaning, if you use an ultimate to begin or in the midst of a fight, it will likely lead to a teamfight win. Trading is a more likely occurrence because the enemy is also trying to win, so they will respond with their own resources to balance out or even tip the scales in their favor. This is where knowing the general economics of the game is really important. If you connect multiple sticky bombs onto a Baptiste and he decides to drop down his immortality field, that's positive trading. Trading one for one to enable yourself or teammates is something to take advantage of. As a ball player, I can use my large HP pool to soak up a lot of these cooldowns, notably Flashbang, and that opens up the opportunity for my uh, Tracer or Winston, you name it. There are definitely more examples like distracting supports, taking away the healing resource away from their tanks, but I want to keep things in the tangible spectrum. You should be familiar with this concept because it's going to be mentioned a lot. The next thing I want to get at is the macroscope of every ability. This part will help determine how to use your abilities to find high value. I like to split each ability into three categories, mobility, crowd control, and utility. Mobility is the most versatile as it acts as an initiator or disengage tool to outmaneuver opponents. Disengage, by the way, is like just retreating in general. My favorite example is Widowmaker, who can do something called a hookshot, giving her a better angle for a potential pick from a headshot, or to use it to escape from threats. What to consider is that it's on a 12 second cooldown, making her vulnerable to dives and flankers. So normally, or typically, it's better used as an escape. This doesn't mean always play safe. What it really means is that you can walk to a flank spot and then when you feel threatened, just peace out and grapple away. Crack control or CC are things that inhibit, stuns, or disrupt, oops, to allow for easy follow-up targets or to throw it off aggressive enemies. Inherently no value by itself besides the odd alt cancellation or environmental kill. The easiest ways for Wrecking Ball to find value is by rolling through enemies during Fireball to disrupt defenses or to slow down the aggression by booping them away from his team. Utility adds offensive or offensive power. Abilities like Shields, Defense Matrix, Repair Packs, and Fortify have the common trait of increasing survivability. 
For offense, Dynamite, Storm Arrows, Turret, Pile Driver are straight up extra damage being dealt and some have a burst factor which is really nice to quickly eliminate a target when they don't expect it. If you really want to know the specifics, I recommend you look up the Overwatch fandom page and it will teach you a thing or two. This brings us to how to play around your kit, more specifically your cooldowns once again. Your cooldowns have a massive influence on how you approach the game and the most obvious example is Doomfist. Doom finds most of his value through a combination of his cooldowns and the follow-up work is usually done with his hand cannon. A typical combo would be punch in, uppercut, do some pew pewing, then slam to get out to safety, right? Now that he's expended those resources, he has to wait the remaining time before those CDs come back online. Abilities are like these metaphorical switches. When an ability is used, there is a temporary power spike, and once it expires, the power level returns back to normal, but your potential power level drops. When you have those abilities back online, now your potential power level is increased. This could be a whole video in of itself, but to keep it brief, having resources enables you to play more aggressive and more freely knowing that you can go for an off angle than grab it out, grapple out like a widow, or triple blink into an entire uh, enemy team, use pulse, then recall out as Tracer. Without those resources, you are practically forced to play more passive around your team or in areas where you can disengage to a mega pack or something like that. It's very easy for enemies to just take advantage of uh, when you have no cooldowns. You're at a weakened state, so of course uh, different flankers want to take advantage of that. Uh, entire enemy teams want to just rush onto you um, because they see these uh, windows. To summarize, play around with resources you have. Use abilities with a purpose. Don't just use them because you have them. Knowing your role now branches out from what you can do individually to how you enable the strengths of your hero and will start to introduce your teammates as part of the picture to search for ways to play around them too. Initially, I want to define space. Space is referred to as areas of a map that wield inherent advantages that are separately called choke points and power positions. There's a reason why teams typically hold in certain spots on defense because choke points are defined by small entrances that expose the attacking team to multiple angles. Six defenders funnel all their attention to one spot where the attackers have to look at six different places. That's why it's called defender's advantage. This is why you never want to cross a choke because then the script changes. Power positions are areas of a map that have the benefit of clear sight lines and protection by hard to reach locations and easy retreats to cover or to a health pack. Power positions basically allows you to do the shooting and also be safe while doing so. Now that you have a definition of space, we're gonna go roll by roll talking about the basic purpose of each. Tanks first. You are the spearhead. Your job is to get your team into position and stabilize the space to support your tank duo, protect your supports, and enable your DPS to pop off. Controlling space is the mini objective for tanks. The more your team controls, the more you'll have success due to defender's advantage. Being a tank means you have the authority to call out where you want to anchor your attack. Obviously tanks aren't created equal, but the idea remains. The only difference is how you fulfill that role with your kit. For DPS, there are so many heroes that it covers a large spectrum for what your role is. Though generally, I would say DPS are the ones who apply pressure and complement the rest of your team comp. To break it down, I'm going to list out three different aspects to keep track of. Uptime. The more you stay alive, the more damage you can do, and the more final blows you get, the more value you'll get over time. By staying alive, you give yourself time for heroes like Widow, Sombra, Doom, and Genji to find picks form up alt charge, especially for Genji, and basically give more opportunities for the kit to uh, find value. Synergizing. Look at your team comp. What can you do to empower them? Mazewell is a great example because placing it to block lanes means a Reinhardt can close the gap much easier to get value himself by swinging his hammer. In a dive composition with Winston and Sombra, if Sombra hacks someone, there is a clear target for the dive to come on through. Maybe you have a Zen on your team, and the enemy team is running a hypermobile comp, like Tracer, even Reaper, or something like that. Playing McCree is a good option because he can sit right next to his Zen, and just by his presence alone, the threat of flashbang to protect his allies. Finishing. And to wrap things up, DPS are the ones who secure eliminations. This is based on mechanics, so there's not much I'm going to say, at least in this guide. What I can tell you is to enable yourself. Taking advantage of power positions makes your life much easier as a DPS. 
take off angles and by creating a surround formation around the enemy it makes it really hard for them to focus at uh, one player at a time remember that you take off angles when you have the resources to do so you don't want to take an off angle just so that you can shoot you need to also think about if you're threatened how to escape and lastly, the support role. Like what I said with DPS and synergizing, what ways are there to empower your team? Just to note, it's not utility as I defined it, but a tool that has a very impactful and direct function. To demonstrate this in this clip, I use Lamp on my Reinhardt so that he can just swing freely without fear. This wasn't supposed to save a life or anything, despite him getting low. Uh, the idea was just to allow the Reinhardt to go aggro. You could do the same with Sound Barrier or triple packing a flanker so that they can duel more comfortably. What makes support a dynamic role is from how much resources you can give to select heroes. Every hero should have their target priority and support is no exception to it. The difference being target priority for supports is more about which teammates are you putting attention towards. Is it better to keep my other support alive when under uh, threat or make sure that DPS can get the resources because they're pretty close to ults and they can possibly turn the fight? Ask questions like these. Contradict yourself and why you would do X and Y. I mean, there is no real answer because every situation is different. Like, you can make a good play, but there might be an even better play. So it's, it's kind of hard to distinguish the two. But through playing games and gaining experience as you experiment with what works and what doesn't, eventually you can fill out your decision tree to make the right split second decisions. Win cons are all about finding ways to win. The first of which is target priority. Having a target priority gives you a focal point from which you attack or hold on defense. To determine a target, you have to analyze what your hero is good at, then looking at the enemy comp and seeing how you can exploit some of their weaknesses. I've got a tier list here for uh, the general target priority as Tracer, who is going to be the hero you are hypothetically playing. The first question is, what is she good at? A hypermobile DPS and can output a lot of damage with potential to one clip squishies. Now looking at the top row here, why are these the primary targets? Zenyatta is a stationary hero, there's no chance of him escaping your attacks. Landing shots on you is hard and the only real risk is the charged up orbs which you can listen for and blink to evade it. You should win this duel 99 times out of 100 but this is an extreme example. So let's look at Winston. Why is he a favorable target and not a primary one? The key thing is that he doesn't actually, I should say, it's unlikely for him to do anything to a tracer. Secondly, he has 500 HP, including armor. There's no way you can burst him down. But you can still do enough damage to harass him, and by doing that, it could force him to jump back out and retreat, which then, that Winston is a non-factor for the time being. Similar to Doomfist, where you can chase him after an engage to actually kill him this time. But before a fight has started, you really don't want to put a lot of effort into focusing on Doom, because he's able to disengage with his movement, and he does threaten you with his punch. The difference between the first and second tier is that the first tier are targets that you're actively hunting. Like those are the ones you're focusing and trying to kill. The second tier, you're not so much trying to focus because there's usually some micro condition. If you happen to meet them, sure, you can take those duels knowing that you're favorable in those battles. But yeah, there's that condition. Doofus engages, usually he's going to be about half HP, tries to get out, and then you just go and chase him down. And this ties into my next point about win cons, punishing. It's the same idea with switches, instead the difference is you're keeping track of switches or the abilities used by the enemy team. When Reaper uses Wraith or on a sleep dart and the notorious Kree flashbang, with Tracer on the field they better play around their team because Tracer is one of the best opportunists who can take advantage of their lower resources and punish. You could also be the one who forces these abilities out. Shoot Zarya a bit and she'll use her bubble most likely. If you happen to have Pulse Bomb and stick it onto a Zarya when her bubble's on cooldown now, with a little more shooting because you gotta do a little more damage, the Pulse Bomb only does 350, so 50 more damage. Now B, that's a good tactic to get a man advantage, yes sir indeed. Apply this to every hero as every hero and you can make an argument for why they should be your primary targets. Now for the last strategy, this is something you're going to need help with. Comboing is, as the name suggests, is when you pair your abilities with those things called teammates who use their abilities in sequence to create a super ability. For someone who doesn't use comms, like myself, and is trying to use combos as a way to climb, alt combos are the best for you. 
they're definitely easier to pull off because there's a distinct sound cue, plus you can press tab to see when your team is close or has their alts. The key ones to look out for are Graviton Surge, Gravitic Flux, Nano, and EMP, which set up combos like Hanzo's Dragon, Death Blossom, practically anything. I mean, there are ways to stack effects like Nano, Damage Beam from Mercy, and Supercharger, which makes Genji's Blade able to one-shot squishies and surprisingly two-shot some tanks. But I'm trying to keep this straightforward, just it's something cool. Then we have combos using the standard cooldowns. The best setup cooldowns are Halt and Pile Driver with abilities that enable play styles like Projected Barrier, Ice Wall, Biotic Nade, plus boops and stuns. I mean, there's there's a lot of options. Knock up an enemy Reinhardt with one of Junkrat's mines and your friendly Rhine can shatter underneath the shield. The biggest challenge is that it takes comms to pull these off, usually. To finish this off, there is one thing you might be missing in your gameplay to help you win games, and this is adapting. You have a game plan, you know what you're trying to do. A target priority, an idea for who you're trying to combo with, uh, maybe after some playtime you figured out a way to counter one of the enemies, but you're losing. What do you do? Well, this is where you reassess your team comp, who works with who, and figure out a way to change up the game plan. You could have probably been doing everything right, like you followed these steps. But what you might have missed is an Ash was on high ground and took out your supports two fights in a row. You could tell this because you looked at the kill feed, so you know she's a problem. One way is counterpicking. You could either try to duel the Ash by picking Genji or mirroring the Ash yourself to apply more pressure on her. Or do the opposite and commit more heavily onto the front line by picking Reaper or Mei to overwhelm their tanks as another solution. Maybe it's not your hero and a change of target priority, so putting more attention onto the Ash instead of the supports is how you get the job done. Alts have a huge influence on how the match is going to play out after multiple times of your team getting sucked into a grab and even with the use of sound barrier, they manage to penetrate through the shields and win the team fight regardless. How about, instead of reacting, save your ult and just take the out? The next fight, you use that sand barrier offensively so that you can press the attack with no fear. Whatever the case may be, ramming your head into a wall is not going to change the outcome. That's insanity. And don't feel bad if you switch off a hero when you have an ult if you think switching to that specific hero and getting their ult a little bit faster than just delaying it one more minute is going to be more beneficial in the long run. And as for our last fundamental, positioning is all about how to not lose. If there's one thing to take from this part, the usage of cover is going to be it. You can avoid a lot of problems by playing around cover. Soldier's Tack Visor, cover. Diva Bomb, cover. Gearing, it's high noon. Cover. Earth Shatter, jump into cover. You get the idea. What shields do, in contrast, is merely augment cover. Their use is blocking line of sight and angles to negate oncoming damage, which then has the effect of allowing for your team to move to the objective point safely. That's to say, if you have the option to use cover, use it. I should bring up the example of Farah because she is one of those heroes that can heavily threaten every 200 HP hero. And without something to absorb some of that damage and a way to enable your hit scans to keep her in check, it's going to be tough. Though on a few maps, what you can do with multiple heroes, you can do with natural cover without spending any resources. There are low ground positions that have a low ceiling that forces especially heroes like Farah to readjust their sight lines just so that they can get a better angle to shoot and that usually leaves them in a much more vulnerable place. These areas essentially give the same effect like a choke point where there are limited entrances so your team can focus attention at specific spots. Lijang Gardens, Nepal Village, the gas station on Route 66, and the rooms on Second Point Junker Town, just to name some. And as for high ground, which I've dubbed them power positions up against less mobile comps, that's their kryptonite. As long as no one from your team, including you, don't overextend and feed their life, you can whittle down resources and have a superior angle to shoot over shields to get picks, and if you want an hour-long presentation about angles and high ground, my Ash VOD review is all about that. What that VOD review doesn't talk about really is overextension. By the way, to give an explanation for what overextension is, it's when you die as a result of overstepping your boundaries, whether that's being easily focused down from poor positioning, dying when one of your key cooldowns was offline, and not respecting a hero, which are all forms of getting punished. We know why certain positions give better angles to attack. 
but just as important are the sight lines and angles the enemies use for their attack. Going back to point form again with three skills to help prevent you from feeding. Awareness. In this context, awareness is not knowing the state of a fight and where every player is around you. What this really comes down to is practice as I've mentioned previously in this guide. Force yourself to look at other aspects of the game such as the kill feed, pressing tab to not only look at your medals but the actual alt charge of your teammates, outlines of your teammates, experience with every hero and how fast their abilities can come online, where they typically like to position, the frequency of cooldowns, just the general flow of a hero. The reason why this is so essential is so that you can anticipate what an enemy might do. So the next time you die by X hero, let's go with Roadhog. First, where is the hog? Did you scout his position? If you couldn't find him, that should get you worried. So how are you going to act? Obviously, you don't want to be looking for him because he's a pretty big threat. What you could do, repositioning to limit angles, making it harder for him to sneak up on you is one way. Or the other is to stick closer to your team and maybe they can assist you. Patience. Patience with your cooldowns is one of the min-max tricks, but to be honest, it's not all that hard. Platts would say otherwise. Yeah, I'm calling you out. If I were to give the example of a Reinhardt that tried to go into six enemy players without a shield, as expected, he would just fall over. So why would you do the same with any other hero? And it doesn't have to be abilities, it could be waiting for teammates to respawn so that you can regroup and fight a fair fight. When there is a lack of resources, tools to use, it's a vulnerability, and without the right amount of patience and discipline to wait for them to come back, I mean, put yourself in a way less effective position, but if it means that you don't die, that's perfect. Those resources eventually come back, and that's the point I'm trying to make. Respect. Having respect has two meetings in Overwatch. Respect the hero choice and unacknowledging threats. Getting over with, a lack of respect for a hero pick is going to get you killed more times than not. I can attest to this because when I switch from PC to console, you could get one shot and call it a fluke, but in PC land, people can just do the craziest flick and you're donezo, consistently. And I do strongly advocate testing your limits on a hero to get the experience of what you can or can't do. But the right way to approach it is by choosing the right moments to attack, which basically means don't peek a sightline when you know the opposing team is generally looking at in that direction. To clarify, this is when you're taking off angles so you don't have a shield in front of your face, you don't have a support that is right next to you pocketing you. If Hanzo is standing right here, you know where he is and he knows where you are. So what's the sense in risking your life? He can one shot. Entire team fights are more than likely determined by which side gets the first pick you do is wait a bit until he's focused on someone else you can kind of see that when he shoots an arrow or take an off angle then you get him when he least expects it if you miss your shots don't panic and re-peak feeling like you need to finish him off play your life and you can probably get another chance at it as per respect for other threats you could have the right target priority you see the zen and i mean that's a juicy target right there you started to engage him but did you think of what the other five enemies were doing this is the enemy attention space. If the Zen was in the midst of their team, it's easy for the other members to quickly turn around and turn you into mincemeat. You're not respecting what the other enemies can do to you, so how can you change this into a positive? Attention is something that can be abused. If you draw attention by just doing simple poke damage, showing that you're a potential backline threat whilst living, you put pressure on the enemy team to do something about it. At this moment, there is no excuse for you to full commit to a target. There are multiple threats to you and they all have all of their resources. When you have split attention, relieving some of the pressure off of your core as some of the enemies try to deal with you, your team advances to apply more pressure to the front line. Resources are used in abilities, but also attention. The Zen has no help and that's when you strike. Hey, thank you all for watching. I'm really hoping that this will be it for these longer videos for now. They take up so much time to work on. Currently, I have all these scripts planned out. They just need to get written and that's what's going on. As I'm piecing together a routine, things will be more consistent in terms of content. The future of this channel is not going to be guide orientated. Playing the game is going to be uh, the other slice of the pie as well. I guess we'll see where it takes us. But anyways, hope you all enjoyed. And the support from you guys is very much appreciated. If you really liked it, make sure to subscribe. I don't give my Twitter very much attention. It's just for keeping up to date with what I'm doing outside of YouTube or maybe YouTube as well, just projects. Do so by looking for at Drake Paulus. Until then, I'll see you when I see you.
Peace.